Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the Power Hour. The hope, the prayer, is that as you listen to the preaching of God's Word, that what you leave with is God's Word. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you. We pray that the Lord may speak to you in a way that you need Him to. If you've been coming for a long time, we pray that the Word never gets stale, but it feels new every time. We are in a series entitled Becoming More, the Aftermath, because it's not enough to come in. It's not enough to start the process if you stay in the same place. You must become more. And the message today is, I'm all in. I'm all in. Turn to somebody and say, I am all in. I am all in. What are you all into? Why do you guys just say stuff that the preachers make you say? Do you, do you understand what you just agreed to? Let me tell you what you just agreed to. You're all into this message. Okay, that's clever. So I've, I've never played poker professionally. But I'm sure some of you here have. If I stare at the audience long enough, I will lock eyes with a gambler. But for those who've either played poker before or watched any James Bond movie, you know what poker is. If you don't know who James Bond is, you need Jesus. <laughs> but if you've played poker before, don't, not really familiar with the rules, but there's a, there's a part where the game, well, it's a, it's a game for me because I'm not a professional, but there's a part uh, on, on the table when somebody says, I'm all in. That means all the chips they have, they are pushing them into the pot, and whatever happens, happens. It is a high-risk, high-reward experience. If I win the pot, I get everything. If I lose the hand, I lose everything. Everything? Everything. There's a man by the name of Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal was a French philosopher who contributed to math and physics, but he was also a Christian. In 2009, when I made the choice to come to Asia, I was having a character of crisis moment that made me question my decision from a cultural perspective and from an experience perspective. And so being in the pastor realm, I started listening to sermons and I came across David Asherick for the first time in 2000. And nine, and, and I listened to a, ma a sermon entitled Pascal's Wager. Now, the title of the sermon interested me because I'm a huge fan, or was a huge fan of Blaise Pascal, because I love philosophers, and I especially love philosophers, Pastor, who understand that philosophy comes from theology, that there is no philosophy without the belief of God. But in our generation, you are considered smart if you don't believe in God. So in his writings called Pensies, Blaise Pascal came up with what is known as the wager. And the wager simply says that if I believe in God and God does exist, I will go to heaven. If I believe in God and he doesn't exist, nothing happens. If I don't believe in God, and it turns out, oops, God is real, you end up in hell, the event, not the place. But if you don't believe in God, and God doesn't exist, nothing happens. You live your life, you die, that's it. But according to Blaise Pascal, the wager is always in the favor of the believer, because think about it. If you do believe that God is, is real, it affects how you think, how you live. You are free from guilt, from shame, from stress, from paranoia, from pain, from anger, because of this godly life that you're living. But if you don't believe in God, you suffer just like the rest of us, you go through all this mess called life, then all of a sudden you are in the wrong place. 
So according to Blaise Pascal and according to his wager, believing in God is better than not believing. In the realm of philosophy, they are still debating his wager because those who don't believe and those who do believe argue that if you are a Christian, you are burdening yourself. If there's anybody in the room today that has not accepted Jesus Christ, and your reason is because you are friends with, born into a family of, married to a sour, lemon-faced Christian, trust me, they are not the standard for Christianity. Christianity is a joyous experience. Christianity takes you from being a shy, skinny kid to being overweight and preaching to people in Jakarta. Amen, somebody. Being a Christian allows you to handle the most worst situation in your life because you believe that things will get better. Being a Christian means you accommodate people from all walks of life. It doesn't matter what they've done, who they are, how they look, how much they have. All you see are children of God. Why? Because you believe in Jesus Christ. So Pascal's wager, it guarantees a life of joy now and a life of joy to come. Would somebody say amen? Amen. I don't know if Blaze was thinking about this passage of scripture, but I felt it fit the moment because Paul is talking to a young man, the, the millennial of his generation, the Gen Z of his generation, and he says to the young man, listen, physical training is good. But training for godliness is much better. Why? It promises benefits in this life and in the life to come. So if you are a gym shark, if you are the kind of person that likes to take care of themselves, you're all about the abs, you're all about the abs, you're all about the abs, that's good. No problem. Eat healthy. Be a vegan. Be a vegetarian. Eat potatoes and lettuce for all I care. But the Bible says you need to work on your godliness more than your body. Because when you are happy, now I'm, I'm not saying don't go to the gym, okay? Don't, don't go to the gym because you will have clothes you can wear again, okay? But I'm saying, according to Paul, godliness is the thing we should work on. Not because we are afraid of hell. We need to stop doing two things. Listen carefully. Stop convincing your children your partner, your your members to become Christians because Jesus is coming soon and because of hell. Those two reasons are not enough. The most important reason for becoming a Christian is to enjoy life now. What is the point of being angry and sad and stressed out because you're thinking, oh, I got to go to church or I'm going to go to hell, and guess what? You end up in hell anyway. What is the point? Christianity is not a ticket to go to heaven. Christianity is about having a life of joy in Jesus. So Paul says, when you live godly, it benefits you in this life and in the life to come. Do you suffer as a believer? Heaven, yeah. Do you have problems as a believer? Yes, you do. Will you face all that the devil has to throw at you? Yes, you will. But the difference is you have the Lord on your side. God is not a fairy tale that people who are poor created to feel better about their life. God is the creator of heaven and earth and of you. And if you don't believe it fully, why are you here? So when you say, I'm all in, what you are saying is, I believe God enough to swim against the tide. I I haven't even read a text yet, so let's look at our text for this morning. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 24. I'm going to read two different scriptures. I'm going to introduce you to three men. And I want you to see the difference between three of them. And I want you to notice who was all in. Acts, chapter 24. I'm going to read from verse 22 all the way down to verse number 26. Let me set up the text for you so that there's a context. The later half of the book of Acts focuses on the three mission journeys of Paul. It focuses on his imprisonment, his beatings, and his near-death experiences. It focuses on the different towns and churches that he ministered to. When you get to Acts chapter 24, Paul is making his way to Rome to appeal for his case. The case is that Paul is a civil, disobedient rebel. 
that he has come to cause problems for the Jews and for the Romans. And so Ananias and other religious leaders have brought him before the governor Felix and they've accused Paul of being a dissenter. And so Paul has made his case why he's innocent. I've said this before, let me drum it in. Paul was a Roman citizen, but he was born a Jew. He was trained Greek. So his life was very diverse and had so many experiences. But at this point, Paul is about to get his head chopped off because Paul was all in. Along his way, along his life, Paul encountered people, both Jews, Gentiles, and pagans. Paul encountered men. He encountered women. He encountered young people like Timothy. He encountered slaves that needed Jesus. He encountered governors. He encountered uh, 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 priests. He encountered Pharisees. He was one of them. And now Paul is about to face the biggest opponent of his life who happens to be Caesar himself. And so the Bible says in Acts chapter 24 and verse number 22, at that point, Felix, who was quite familiar with the way. Pause. Christians were not called Christians until Antioch, but at this point they were known as the people of the way which meant they lived life the way, according to the words of Jesus, they did what he did, they said what he said, and they lived how he lived. They were the people of the way. At that point, Felix, who was quite familiar with the way, adjourned the hearing and said, wait until Lysias, the garrison commander, arrives. Then I will decide the case. He ordered an officer to keep Paul in custody, but to give him some freedom and allow his friends to visit him and take care of his needs. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Sending for Paul, listen, Felix, Roman, Drusilla, Jew. They sent for Paul and they listened to him as he told them about faith in Christ Jesus. As he reasoned with them about righteousness, self-control, and the coming day of judgment, listen, Felix became frightened. And like many of us, his response was, go away for now, he replied, when it is more convenient, I'll call for you again. He also hoped that Paul would bribe him, and so he sent for him quite often and talked with him. Pastor, this governor wanted to listen to Paul preach, not because he wanted the gospel, but he wanted money. He wanted access so that he could get money from this man because he understood that Paul is a high-profile prisoner, that there's somebody out there willing to pay money for him. And so he allowed Paul, like some of you, he allowed Paul to preach to him, not every Saturday, but every day. He would call for Paul from his cell and sit him down. He called his wife who was a Jew. His wife was a Jew who had been divorced and he had married her. And now this Roman and this Jewish woman are listening to Paul. He talks to them about three things. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment. And when he, Felix, heard about these three things, the Bible says he was frightened. Why would the message of righteousness and self-control frighten a man? The first thing I want to talk about this morning real quick is convenience over conviction. When I think about the word convenience in 2023, I picture a young lady with a coffee, a Starbucks coffee in one hand, her cell phone in the other, and her standing by the side of the road waiting for a grab car or an Uber. That's what convenience looks like for me. Convenience for me is when our food is late by five minutes and my wife is not happy with the delivery guy. Convenience for me is when somebody texts me a message and five minutes later are complaining, why haven't you complained? Convenience is my son running to the stage and I got to keep preaching like I didn't see him. Convenience is the biggest problem for this generation. 
Convenience is a problem for this generation. When we pick jobs, we pick them based on how close they are to the apartment, based on how close they are to the mall. When we date somebody, we want to know how quickly do I have access to you? Do you have a car? Do you have stuff? Because I'm here out of convenience. So we pick somebody based on proximity, Pastor. Not, okay. Convenience is a dangerous thing. Let me tell you what convenience has done. Convenience has brought us to the place where we will eat food not knowing how it was prepared. We have more faith in restaurants than we do in God. Do you understand that a stranger makes your food and a stranger delivers it? You don't know what happens to your food. All you care about is that it arrives in 30 minutes. You keep drinking these lattes and these coffees, just stuffing your face with all this stuff. What are you trusting in? Oh, pastor, I'm too busy. Hustle culture, baby. No time to cook. Convenience. We even have convenience stores. The other day, I was counting how many Indomarets uh, and, and what's the other ones called? See, you all even know them. Do you know, you know what they're called? They're called convenience stores. Open 24-7, and they have all the stuff that you think you need. Convenience stores. The remote control. The man who created the remote control, do you know why he invented the remote control? It was for convenience for disabled people. But do you know that ever since the advent of the, the remote control, there's a correlation between the breakdown of families in America with the invention of the remote control. How crazy is that? That people became couch potatoes, they watched more television, and when the devil thought, you know what, the remote control is not enough. Let me give them more channels. I remember as a kid, as how old I am, I remember when our TV had eight buttons for eight channels, Pastor. Today, you can't even count the channels, you count platforms. Disney+, Plus, Paramount+, Plus, Netflix, and all these other ones that I know you all are subscribed to. Yeah, your, your offering has been cut down because of your Netflix bill. Convenience, convenience over conviction. This man, he refused to accept conviction because he understood if I accept Paul's message, first of all, I have to divorce this woman I'm married to because I shouldn't be married to her, number one. Number two, to ask a Roman governor at that time to practice self-control was hard. The Romans were all about pleasure and satisfaction and intimacy without commitment. The Romans were the most pleasure-seeking people at that time. So that was difficult for him. And when he mentioned the judgment, any human being, I don't care how Gucci you think you are, when somebody brings up judgment, anybody gets uncomfortable. In fact, as I'm preaching, some of you are thinking, oh, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable right now. Because people think when you accept Jesus, when you become all in, you lose something. There's a conversation that happens between Jesus and Peter. Jesus talks to a rich young ruler and he says to him, you say that you've kept all the commandments, but you lack one thing. Give up all you've got, sell it and give to the poor. And the Bible says the young man was not willing to go all in and then he left. See, that conversation has never bothered me. The one that has bothered me is the one that happened after. Jesus looks at the disciples and the disciples say, if he can't make it, then who can? Jesus says, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter says, we've given up everything for you. I know you've read that text and you've admired Peter. That's not what Peter was saying. Peter was saying, we're not like him. We've given up everything for you. What do we get? What do you do? We've given up everything for you. We gave up a fishing business. What's in it for us? Because that's how we think. We look at the Christian experience as about being rewarded and not the fact that you have God in your life. And then Jesus says to him, whoever gives up father, mother, and everything, and house, will get father, mother, and house, and persecution, and eternal life. Because at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, Christianity is the only job where the benefit is life insurance. All the job conditions are not great. You lose friends. You lose reputation. You lose followers. You become the least liked. And if you are in a country like this, you are least, you are the minority. But a minority with God is a majority any day. 
Because conviction has to affect righteousness. Conviction has to affect self-control. Conviction has to affect judgment. Here's the problem. Convenience and conviction can never occupy the same space. I know people who have stopped coming to worship with us, and I get it, because it's hot in here. It's getting hot in here. But don't, 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 don't take off your clothes, right? It, it, it's, it's hot in here. Somebody, Pastor, we, we love to worship, but it's, it's too hot. We, we want air conditioning. I, I don't want to sit in a place where there's people around me. I, I need comfort. I need comfort. Please fix your microphones. Fix your, 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 your speakers. And, and Pastor, the sermon, we need sermons that are good. Convenience. Convenience. That's what we're looking for. We don't care about the God factor. We just want to be here to say to ourselves, tick the box, I was in church. Convenience and conviction cannot occupy the same space. These men and women in the book of Acts were willing to die for what they believed. Some of y'all are not even willing to give up your jobs in order to live a righteous life. I told you when I started this month, I told you that, listen, the, when you get into the book of Acts, the bar gets set very high. I'm trying my best to lower it, but I cannot. But because everybody we're encountering, Pastor, is either dying for Jesus or being beaten up or thrown in prison. For us... The moment somebody comments on our picture, when you post, oh, just came out of church at Pacific Place, hashtag God is good. And they're like, oh, you go to church? We delete the post. Oops, that's not my Instagram uh, feed is for. Convenience and conviction cannot comfortably occupy the same space. Here's a warning that comes from a place of love. You become less when you nurture the habit of postponing the most important decisions in life for perceived convenience perceived convenience to think that you can walk with God for so many years and easily just walk away. You are lying to yourself. What you get when you're outside the will of God is paranoia. You think people are talking about you. You actually have this assumption that people care about your life. Somebody said it correctly. If you are going through problems, if you've made mistakes and you think everybody cares, here's what you need to know. 80% of the people literally don't care. 20% are happy they're not you. That's it. Everybody's got something going on. The world does not revolve around you. So when you're thinking about conviction, it's not about you and the pastor. It's about you and Jesus Christ. So when I'm speaking to you, I'm not asking you to be accountable to me. Who am I? I'm saying when you hit the pillow at night, it's you and God. You can lie to yourself. You can surround yourself with people that tell you, it's okay, lad. So, you know, Christians, it's, it's too much. You're doing too much. Jesus is not here, yet you're doing too much. Oh, no, you're not doing enough. A young lady posted on Instagram uh, some time back, and this, this video became viral. And it's one of those uh, Charlie Chaplin videos where uh, she doesn't say anything, but you see the words on the screen. And it said, some people say that you only live once, so live your best life. But she says, one day you get to live forever, so why not prepare for the best life? See, we don't care about eternity. We care about now. Pastor, I'm young. I'm going to get old one day. I need to live my best life. Now, as a 40-something-year-old man, I'll tell you this. When you live your best life in your 20s, one day you're going to be 40. And when you look back, you're going to be like, man, I could have made better choices. Let's go to the second passage of Scripture. Acts chapter 26. So Felix rejected Jesus because he wanted con convenience. He rejected a life of service because all he wanted was money from Paul, but not really to hear about Christ. Acts chapter 26, verse 28 and 29. Paul encounters the next ruler, King Agrippa. Agrippa has a history through his family. His great grandfather tried to kill Jesus Christ at the age of two. His grandfather had Stephen beheaded. His father, I'm sorry, let me read it. Acts chapter 24, 26, 28, and 29. Paul makes his case again to Agrippa. Paul speaks to the king. He has spoken to the governor, gotten nowhere. He goes to the king and he, he begins to make his case. And in Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 24, Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. 
much learning is driving you mad. Because when you make a case for Christianity, people say you are too religious, you are holier than thou. Why you got to do that? Why you got to go online and talk about Jesus? Why not make your relationship with him private? You're mad because of your beliefs. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. Since this thing was not done in a corner. Do you know what Paul is saying about King Agrippa? He's saying, Agrippa, you and your family are very familiar with Jesus Christ. You know him. You know what he did. You know what he said. You know better. And then... He looked at the king in verse 27 and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Listen to Agrippa's response in verse 28. This is the pastor's nightmare. This is a missionary's worst dream. When somebody looks at you and says, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Churches are full of almost persuaded people. We are looking for that magical, motivational sermon that changes everything. That sermon when the pastor preaches, all our weaknesses disappear, all our fears are gone. We are, we are convicted that even if I become a Christian, I keep my job, I keep my business, I keep my lifestyle. We are looking for that sermon that gives us permission to be what we want to be while following Jesus. I want to tell you right now, it does not exist. Yes, there are preachers and teachers who will tell you what you want to hear. There are many of them. But I'm here to tell you that if you truly want to be a Christian, it comes from a place of conviction and not convenience. But King Agrippa looked at him and said, man, so close. If I let you keep talking, I just might join. Stop talking, I'm good. Do you know that um, almost is worse than convenience? Do you know that almost doesn't count? Pastor, you know that almost doesn't count, right? Th think about it. You rush to the airport, okay? You rush to the airport. You make it through security. You go to the checkpoints, but you get to the check-in gate, and the lady tells you, oh, sorry, sir, the flight just left 30 minutes ago. You're like, ah, almost. Anyway, I'll try again next time. Can you imagine uh, planning a wedding? Yeah, and I'm, let me stand right here. Can you imagine planning a wedding, your family comes from around the world, your friends are all dressed up, and, and, and everybody is all ready, and all of a sudden, the bride almost makes it to the altar. Somebody said, when the outcome matters, almost is never good enough. Nobody can say, I almost graduated. Nobody can say, I almost lived a healthy life. Nobody can jump out of a bed and be like, oops, I almost put on a parachute. You walk in the rain, you get wet. Well, I almost remember to carry my umbrella. Almost does not count. Almost doesn't count. If the doctor comes out of the surgery, I'm like, well, that was a close one, family. We almost saved your son. We'll try again next time. Almost doesn't count. Have you ever heard of this crazy, I don't want to call it a sport. I am not going to validate it like that. Have you ever heard of uh, uh, skydiving without a parachute? Anybody here done it? Okay, so you've played poker, but you've never jumped out of a, an air balloon without a parachute. Okay, noted. There's this thing that people do as a thrill where they jump out of the air balloons without a parachute, and midway some distance, the guy with the parachute comes and catches you. That man almost jumped out of the basket with a parachute. The most frustrating thing in hell is not going to be the Hitlers, and I assume that Hitler's going to be in hell. I don't know. Don't make that assumption. Right? I hear people say, oh, Hitler's going to be in hell. How do you know that? How do you know? Right? The most frustrating thing is to spend your life going to church, fighting with church people, gossiping with church people, fighting about church programs, fighting about this and fighting about money, and always in issues, your, your kids and their kids, and all of a sudden you don't make it and you're in hell. Do you know how frustrating it is to have done all of that and not made it? Do you know how frustrating it is to have a neighbor who's never gotten up to go to church at all? And all of a sudden, they standing in the new Jerusalem. You see, God has a sense of humor, Pastor. The walls of the city are see-through, meaning that the people inside can see the people outside. Can you imagine your neighbor waving at you from inside and you're outside with your vegetarian eating self? 
You missed out on all the pizzas and all the pig feet and all the whiskey and all the brandy, but you're outside, not inside. All because you were almost saved. Agrippa was almost saved. He missed out. He missed out because of his great-grandfather, because of his grandfather and his own father. He chose the legacy of kingship over a relationship with Jesus Christ. What is it that's going to make you almost make it? Is it your partner? Is it your job? Is it your love of money and fame and entertainment? Is it your own choices? Finally, let's talk about the man who was all in. And we know who this is. This is Paul. Paul was beaten. Scratch that. When God called Paul in Acts chapter 9, God told him that his life would end tragically. Paul received the mission to be a messenger of Christ, knowing the outcome. And so what Paul did is he understood how it would end. And so he lived his life without fear all the way to the end. When you read the passage I'm about to read to you, you'll understand how much Paul was in. Paul's ultimate goal when he started was to end up in Rome because Paul understood Yes, I want to deal with the Jews. Yes, I want to deal with these people. But God has called me to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. You haven't taken the gospel if you don't talk to those who run the world. And so Paul had this idea that I need to go to Rome. He's in prison for two years, pastor. He's fighting for his life, not because he wants freedom. He wants access to the king. Acts chapter 26, verse 31 and 32. The men say, if only Paul had not appealed to Caesar, he would have been set free. They were willing to let him go. But Paul said, I don't care about governors. I don't care about the king. I want Caesar. Because Paul understood, if I can witness to the most influential person in the room, I have not done anything. Meanwhile, we say we're in because we look cute when we leave the house. We come to church, we go home, we think that's enough. There's a story as I close about a young man who happened to be in a poker game. And, 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 and poker can be very stressful because you're losing money. It's worse when you have a trash talk on the other side who's, who's taunting you and mocking you. And so this young man was losing money. He got upset. He took out a gun. Why would you take a gun to a poker game? Only the Lord knows. And he shot a man, and he was sentenced to death on the electric chair. This is around the 80s, 90s. And so he's in prison he used to be a Christian, but as most people do, like the prodigal son, they leave home never to come back. The prodigal son made it back, but this man is in prison. Family members appeal, church members appeal, the community appeals, and somebody gets the governor's attention. You see, the governor is the one who can pardon you, even in the last minute, Pastor. And so because the governor is a Christian, he decides, this young, young man used to be a Christian. Let me dress up like a preacher. See, back in the day, the preachers didn't do this. This is just lazy. Back in the day, they put on robes and they look like, like men of God, right? And so he puts on the garment and he goes to the man's cell. As he arrives at the cell, the young man looks at him and says, nope, I'm not interested. I lived with Christianity. Look where it got me. I'm not interested. The governor leaves disappointed. The warden of the prison comes. He says to the young man, hey, so good news. It's like, good news? I don't want to hear the good news because to a Christian, good news means what? The gospel. He says, what, what did the governor say? And he said, the governor? That was a preacher. No, that was the governor. He came with a pardon to give you. On the electric chair, the young man is given a chance to say his last words, and this is what he said. To all the young men in America, I want you to understand something. I am not being executed because I committed a crime. I'm not being executed because I'm a bad person. I'm being executed because I, I refused the pardon from the governor. Not a single person in the fires of hell will burn because God rejected them. Not a single one. I don't care what these preachers are saying to you outside. Nobody is going to be lost because God rejected them. Everybody who's going to burn, it's because they rejected God. 
The God of the Bible is always coming at us. He's always coming to us. When Adam and Eve messed up, God came to them. When Abraham was called, God came to him. Moses, God came to him. Israel, God came to them. He said to them, make me a sanctuary that I might live amongst you. That wasn't enough. They sent Jesus, call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is always looking for you. Don't care about these judgmental preachers that tell you that you're not good enough. God knows you're good enough. It's you that doesn't think you're good enough. Charles Spurgeon, one of the most prolific preachers to ever walk this earth, he said, to be almost saved is to be all together last. Eve was almost saved, but she decided to eat the fruit. Lot's wife was almost saved, but she decided to look back. Many people in scripture were almost saved, but because they rejected the word of God, we know them for negative things. And yet God says, no matter how bad a person you are, the more you keep coming to me, the faster I get to you. Because to be almost saved is to be altogether lost. I'm done. I haven't done this in a long time. I asked Pastor Henry, we need to start giving these things out because I know some of you are too shy. You are too concerned with what people think, and so you're not going to get up from your chair and come to the front. So we're going to make it convenient for you. Here's the convenience. This paper, you get to write your name. You get to ask for Bible studies. Pastor can serve you with many opportunities. You can, can, can join the church. You can be baptized, membership, whatever. It's all here. It's convenient. Put your name. Pastor, please stand up. Please stand up. All right, please stand up. Do you? Okay. Pastor Henry is the man of God in this place. Oh, my eyes inconveniencing me. Is it because I made you stand up? You speak to the pastor. He has a bunch of these. Him and I stand at the back. He's going to slip you one of them if you want it. You put your name on it and you tell him, I want Bible study. Or you've done Bible study. You've been wrestling. You've been engaged to Jesus for 10 years, but you haven't married him yet. You get to talk to the man of God and he can make it happen. If that's your request, talk to him. But right now, what I want to ask everybody in the room, Lord, Give me the strength to be all in. If that's you, stand to your feet. I don't want to be like Festus. He was a governor. He had power. He had a motorcade that moved traffic aside to get him where he needed to go. But he was afraid. I don't want to be like King Agrippa. He had power. But he also was almost persuaded because he knew he needed Christ, but he couldn't do it because he was the king. I want to be like Paul. I get to live for Christ and one day die for him. I get to speak about him and reason about him. I get to tell my story. See, every time Paul went around, beloved, Paul didn't present himself as this powerful preacher. No, he, he always spoke about the fact he tried to kill Christians. He tried to persecute them. He always talked about that. But it always ended with, it's all about Christ. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Dear Father, I've been doing religion with the people in this room and others for a very long time. So I understand that when appeal is made, there's this religious pressure to stand up and be counted amongst them so that the preacher doesn't get offended that nobody stood up. But Father, it is not the physical standing that I care about in this moment. The question is, have they stood up in their hearts for you? The Bible says that God takes up three positions. When God stands up, he stands up to defend his people. When God is walking around, the gospel is being preached. But one day, God stands up. That's a position of judgment. I'm not here to make anybody afraid because the judgment is not enough to go all in with Christ. What is enough is knowing that when I live the life of Christ, I get to be happy. I get to have a perspective about life that is different. I'm not overwhelmed by public opinion. I don't care about trolls and judgmental people. I only care that my life is where it's supposed to be with Christ. That is what I pray for everybody in this room. I pray that they will stop playing church and that they will consider what is righteousness? What does it mean to live a righteous life? What areas of my life do I need to practice self-control? What is it, Lord? What is it that I need to become more of? To feel comfortable. I want to say to somebody in the room right now. The judgment is not something that should be against you. It's something that should be for you. 
The Bible says judgment begins in the house of God, not because God wants to punish his people or judge them, but because he wants to vindicate them. He wants to exonerate them. He wants to give them his grace so that when he deals with the world, the church is ready to receive them. But Lord, we are struggling with righteousness. We are struggling with self-control. And Father, we are afraid of the judgment. We are not ready. We are not ready. We don't understand that Jesus is the judge and he's our lawyer. He's our witness and he's the jury. He is our character witness. In fact, we were found guilty, but Jesus said, I've paid the price. And so this moment I pray for somebody in here that they would ignore the sinner standing in front of them, but they would see Jesus Christ himself offering them grace and mercy and forgiveness and peace of mind. Because when you go all in with Jesus, he comes through for you. He will help you in every area of your life. Just when you think it can get fixed, Jesus shows up. He is the great physician. He is a friend. He is a father. He is a wonderful counselor. He is a mighty God. He is our savior. And so I pray that somebody here would ignore the voices in their head. They would ignore the devil telling them, you've been here before. You've tried this before. You've been hopping from church to church. You know what you are. Ignore the devil and listen to Jesus. The devil is a defeated foe. He speaks like a lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's got your back, baby. He's got you. And so, Father, I pray with my hand raised up, may you walk ahead of these people to show them that they don't have to do the walking. You will walk for them. May you walk behind them so that they don't look back and want to give up and go back to what they were. May you walk by their side so they don't feel alone. They don't feel abandoned in their choice to go all in. I pray that you will surround them. The Bible says that the devil comes like a flood, but God lifts up a standard against him. But above all things... Be in their hearts so that they don't have to worry about losing their friends. But they will be comfortable walking away because it's for going all in with Jesus Christ. Father, we go all in on our jobs. We go all in on our relationships. We go all in on our health. We go all in on our businesses. We go all in on our children. We go all in on our spouses. We even become bankrupt because of our habits and lack of control. But today, we want to go all in on Jesus. Give us the power to do so. If this is your prayer, let me hear you say amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. You may take your seat.